Okay, now I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about some key points of muscle physiology. And the book that I reference is uh, Don Newman's um, kinesiology book, the second edition. And the graphs that I show you are in the book. Obviously, these are hand drawn, so they're going to look better in the book. So just, just briefly talk about muscle physiology. When you think of muscle activation, um, typically you think of, or you should think of, um, the red part, what's called the contractile part, the actin and the myosin. Okay, so you have the calcium influx, and then you have the actin, the myosin connecting to the actin, and you have the power stroke, and you have um, what's called the, the sliding filaments, and you have a shortening of the sarcomere, and that's how force is produced, okay, through that cross bridge formation of the actin and the myosin. How much force a muscle produces actively is completely dependent on the number of cross bridges are formed. And the number of cross bridges formed is going to depend on how the actin and the myosin are lined up. So it's dependent on length, right? So if the actin and myosin are kind of far apart, all right, even when they try to shorten, you're not going to get a lot of cross bridges. If they're too close together, um, they're already too, kind of connected and you're not going to get a lot of cross bridges. There's kind of a sweet spot kind of in the middle where they can do what's called the big, what they call a power stroke sometimes in the muscle physiology literature and produce the most force. Okay, so that's how muscle force is produced with, how, with the contractile elements. It's totally dependent on the number of cross bridges that the actin and the myosin can form. And the number of cross bridges is going to be dependent on the relationship of the actin and the myosin or the length of the muscle. Now that's for the individual sarcomere, but you can go ahead and expand that out to the entire muscle. It's the same thing. Okay? That's the active part of the muscle, what we call the contractile elements. There's another part of muscle that you may not think about, um, the non-contractile elements. Okay? So these are the parts, this is not the actin and myosin part. This is what's called, the, what are otherwise known as the passive elements of the muscle. This would include the tendon, which is the part of the muscle that connects the muscles to the bone. It also includes what we call the mesiums, the epi, the peri, and the endomesium. Um, the mesiums are just kind of coverings of the muscle. Uh, the epimesium, epi on top of, that covers the entire muscle. Okay? The perimesium um, covers different parts of the muscle. And the endomesium covers the individual muscle fiber. So you have these three different systems encasing the muscle. Um, in the trail guide book, he draws an analogy with an orange, which it actually works quite well, although muscle doesn't look anything like an orange. If you think of the rind of an orange, that's kind of the epimesium, covers the entire orange, right? And when you take off the rind, you still have another covering, covering the entire muscle, that would be the paramecium. And then when you take off the sections, right, there's still a little bit more covering, and that would be the endomesium. And it's very similar to muscle. You have the muscle as a whole, then you have parts of the muscle, um, where different uh, blood vessels in that flow through, and then you have the individual muscle fibers, just like you have the sections of an orange. So that's a good way to think about it, although they don't actually look alike. So you have the active elements of the muscle, the contractile elements, and you have the passive elements of the muscle. Um, both of these contribute to force production. Okay, so I've already talked about how the contractile elements work. How do the passive elements work? Well, it turns out they work very similar to a rubber band. Okay, so when I have a rubber band here, right, and when I just hold a rubber band like this, okay, there's really not, nothing's really happening, right? But when I move my fingers apart, what happens? You get tension, right? You can feel it. And if I was to let it go, that tension would, would um, change into like an active energy and the, and the rubber band would fly across the room, okay? Um, but there's really nothing happening in the rubber band, right? It's kind of a passive kind of movement. What's really causing um, that tension is really my fingers moving it, right? If I just have the rubber band right here, just lying there, it doesn't do anything. But if I actively begin to increase its length, okay, increase that tension, I've created a force that could go on and do other things if I, if I chose it to, okay? The other thing that you should notice, right, is when you, first, when you first start to move a rubber band apart, right, sometimes especially, say if I started like this, even when I move my fingers apart, there's no tension, right? It takes a little bit before you've kind of drawn out that slack, and then the tension actually increases, right? And the longer the rubber band is, the farther I move it apart, the more tension that I have, all right? It turns out that the passive elements, the non-contractile elements, so I'm talking about the tendon and the mesiums, they produce force exactly the same way. If you were to, um, to draw a curve, which I'll show you in a minute, it looks very similar to this rubber band. Um, now, a couple of things I want to say. One is that um, I'm going to talk about the passive and the active elements separately um, because they, they, work very, they work in different ways, and you can do that in a laboratory setting, 
In real life, they are always working together, okay, which is why we'll talk about a combined, we'll talk about an, an active and a passive curve and then a combined curve. And the combined curve is what actually happens in real life. But it turns out you can look at these things separately and they, they look very different, okay. Um, so like I said, the passive elements work just like a rubber band, okay. So in the very beginning, there's actually no force produced because I've got a little bit of slack, okay. But then as I move the fingers farther apart, as I make the rubber band longer, you get more force, okay? So it's dependent on length, okay? Now I'm gonna talk about the curves a little bit, okay? So here I have um, what's called the passive curve and what's called the active curve, and they look very different, okay? So let's talk about how what's similar to both these graphs. In both cases, um, we're talking about tension, which you can also think of as force, just tension is a term people tend to use, versus length, okay? So as you move along this axis, you're talking about a muscle getting longer, okay? As you move along this axis, you're talking about increase in force production, okay? So this is the passive, what's called the passive length tension curve, all right? So you notice it's kind of flat in the beginning, and that's just like in the rubber band, okay? You're starting to take out the slack, so that's why there's not much going on here. But then, you get an increase in force with an increase in length, okay? Again, just like a rubber band. Just like a rubber band, exactly, it works exactly the same way. Increase in tension with increase in length. That's the passive tension curve. And this is always going on, okay? So when you move, when you move your joint, when, when the muscle's being actively moved, okay, the passive elements are kind of being taken through their paces like this. All right, this is the active curve, okay? It's a little funky because I drew it, but basically it's kind of shaped kind of like an upside down U. Completely different than the passive curve. Um, so what, what both these curves have in common is that the force is dependent on length, but they have a different type of relationship to length. So they said with the passive curve, it works like a rubber band. The longer it is, the more force there is. But the active curve is quite different, because what do we say about active force production? That is dependent on the actin and myosin. It's dependent on the number of cross bridges. More cross bridges, more force, all right? And how many cross bridges you can form depends on the length, but it's not this kind of relationship, right? Um, when you have, when things are very close together, which is kind of in here, you're not going to have a lot of cross bridge formation because there's really no place to go. Um, when they're very far apart, which would be down here, um, you don't have a lot of cross bridge formation either because they're too far apart, they can't get together. It's this kind of sweet spot in the middle where they can really form a lot of cross bridges that you have maximum force. So that's why the curve looks like that. It's still dependent on length but it's a very different type of relationship, okay? This is just a question of increasing tension with increasing length, okay? Just like the rubber band, okay? That's what you can think of the mesians and the tendon. They just act like a rubber band. But the active um, elements, they need to have, they have a certain relationship where they have to form those cross bridges, okay? And that's kind of in the middle. So that's your active curve, okay? Passive and active curve. In both cases, you're mapping tension against length. Okay, now I'm gonna go to what's called the combined curve, okay? And again, these pictures are in the Newman book. You can see a better picture. So here's kind of your active curve here, and here's your passive curve here. So the combined curve is going to come up and continue to go up. Okay. So basically, what happens when you actively use your muscle, um, you, it starts to go up from the very beginning because that's the active part. Okay. And then right around where the active curve kind of falls off. Okay. So over in here, when you're not getting that cross bridge formation. This is actually when the passive elements really can kick in because they're going to get stronger as they get stretched. Okay, so what this means is that you have um, you have a regular, not quite linear, but you have a regular increase in force production throughout the entire range with those two acting together. This is what happens in real life. Okay, you have both acting together, but they're just acting in different ways. So when you actively contract your muscle, you have the actin and the myosin forming the cross bridges. That's principally going to be in this part, okay? But even while they're doing the cross bridges, as you go through that range of motion, you have, um, you have those passive elements in there too, and this is where they're going to keep going. So when the active falls off, the passive keeps going, because again, it's a different relationship. So I want to emphasize, this is during active movement, okay? Some students get confused and think because you talk about passive elements, you're talking about passive range of motion. I'm not. This is always, this is true for active movement. When you're actively using your muscles, you have two things go force production coming from two different places. The actin and the myosin, the contractile elements, the parts that are really physiologically active, 
and from those passive elements, from the tendon, from the epi, and the peri, and the endomysiums, they're also producing force. And those forces combined create this total curve. Okay, so this is what happens in real life. These are kind of isolated. You can isolate them out because they act differently. Because you have both these forces acting together, you have, um, you have, a, you have better force production. This spot in the middle is what's known as the resting lane. So kind of the common position where muscles usually are, and it's kind of right in the middle, um, which is going to be physiologically very useful. And that's um, some basic muscle physiology.